Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I'm Trevor with Maker Experiment, and in today's video, I'm going to be comparing the Epilog Fusion Maker to the Glowforge Pro. Let's get into it. Before I get started, a little disclaimer, I did not pay for either one of these machines. Uh, they were provided to me specifically to do videos and testing. The Glowforge Pro I've had for the last maybe six months and I've been working with it. And the Fusion Maker I've had for maybe two weeks, but it is largely based on the other line of Epilog, which is the Fusion Edge. And I've had one of those for about two years. I've had plenty of time to look at both platforms and there's a lot of interesting things about both. Now, before I get a bunch of comments about it, yes, I do own Epilogs. I've been working with them for years. However, I'm going to be as impartial as I can be in this test and stick to just the facts. So I'm going to go through some tech specs of the differences of the machines. I'm going to go over some of the warranty support information as well as the accessories you can get. And most importantly, I'm going to be doing some real life testing of various scenarios to give you real time machining, real time machine times and results. So if you have any questions throughout the video about either machine or what's being compared, put them in the comments below and I will do my best to answer all of those. Now, keep in mind, this is my experience of using both machines and other people may have slightly different experiences. Just try to keep that in mind as you're watching the video. This video is split up into chapters. So if you check the description below, it will have the timestamps for everything if you're interested in looking at the different sections. So first up, Let's get into the tech specs. I'm gonna show you where to find the tech specs online, but I'm going to actually show you some differences that I see on the actual machines. So let's hop on over to the internet and I'll show you where to find them. So I have the Glowforge side up here on the left and the Epilog on the right. If I go to Glowforge and hit products, if I start scrolling down, I'll see that the Glowforge Pro is in the middle. It has some information about warranty, the laser tube power and speed. And then it has a little bit more about the actual size of the machine. If you click on the C full specs, you'll see their full comparison of specs against their other machine lines. On the epilogue side, if I go to the home page and I click on discover the fusion maker and scroll down, you'll see a few specs up here at the top. But if you keep scrolling all the way to the bottom, you'll see a full list of all the specs that they have. Now that I've shown you where to find the specs, I wanna highlight some of the differences. First, let's talk about the machine size and the work area. So overall, the Glowforge is 38 inches wide. The front to back depth is about 21. I think their website lists 20.75. On the website, they list 20.75, but to me, it's closer to 20 and 7 eighths. And if you come to the middle where this decorative handle is, that part is about 22. And then on the height, the website says 8.25, but it's closer to eight and a half. When it comes to the actual machine work area, the first thing I wanna point out is the lids open quite a bit differently. So this one is kind of tough to open, honestly, and it has springs in the back, but you'll see that like if I let it go, it just kind of stays in place like that. And I've been told if you actually open it too far, you can break the hinges on the lid. So I tend to only open it maybe 85% of the way. On this one, you can fold the front door down and it does have the crumb tray that will lift out. And you'd have your bare surface on the bottom. Removing this tray is how you get your extra height. And then if you put this back in, there are little holes in the back that this aligns with. And sometimes it takes a minute to line them up. So the work area on this one is listed online at 19.5 inches, which is the width and 11 and a half inches deep. It is longer if you use the pass through, they claim it's infinity. If you measure the bed, it is at about 20 and three eighths, but the machine can't actually machine that far. You do have at least a little bit of room to overhang some material. And then on the depth side, it is about 12 and three quarter, but again, the machine can only go up to 11 and a half. This is just so you can hang a little bit larger piece of material. 
All right, next up on the epilogue, we're going to measure the same measurements we just did on the Glowforge. So on machine width, we have about 39 and a half. On the depth, it's 26 at the smallest part. And then at the decorative part where it comes out on the middle, it is 26 and a half. So this measurement, the 26 and a half, is actually what they put into the specs online. So this does account for the widest point of the machine. For the height, the machine is about 17 and 7 eighths. Online it says 17.9, so I would say that that matches. And the last dimension that's really important is the Z height. So on the Glowforge, the Z height is two inches if you take out the bed. If you don't take out that bed, it's only 0.5 inches. So you don't have a lot of adjustment, which makes it pretty much impossible to do things like Yetis or other tumblers or cylindrical items. On the epilogue, the Z height is actually seven inches that you can get in there. And doing things like Yetis or tumblers, there is a rotary attachment that I'll touch on later. Uh, so you can do all those kind of things with the epilogue. Now, when you open the lid of the epilogue, if you lift it up, eventually the gas springs will take over and it will start to slowly open for you. You can open it all the way and you don't have to sit there and babysit it. On the epilogue, the table is magnetic. The Glowforge is also magnetic. The list online is a 12 inch by 24 inch area. And from the ruler to the lip is about 24 and three quarter. So it gives you a little bit more area to put a piece of material. And the depth is about 12.5 inches. Again, you can only go up to 12 inches for the actual machinable area. Before I go any further, I do wanna mention that I did do a full breakdown video on the Fusion Maker and took off all the panels, showed you where everything was. I will link that up at the top so that you can watch that video if you're interested. As for the Glowforge, I haven't done a full breakdown video, but there are plenty of them online that you can search for. Uh, I didn't really feel the need to reinvent that wheel because I'm not going to be going super in depth on every single aspect of both machines just to reduce the time of this video. I'm only going to be highlighting the differences that I notice. One of the first things that I notice, besides the lids and how they're constructed with the hinges is how the machines are constructed. So the Glowforge has injection molded plastic as the body. It all, all of it seems to be one piece minus, you know, the lid and the front panel that come down. So there's no access panels to the sides or anything like that to be able to get to the components. And there is the pass through on the back and the front but that doesn't allow access to components. Now, you do have the tube and the laser head on the gantry, uh, but that's about all that you have. On the epilogue, the materials are metal, so most of the body is aluminum. Uh, it does have a couple of powder-coated steel parts, but the vast majority is aluminum. It does make it really stable having it be all metal. The best part about that is you can have access panels to everything. So if you watch the video that I did on the Fusion Maker, you can take off pretty much every panel of this machine and get access to every component. That's gonna be a big game changer when it comes to being able to maintain and clean and change out parts. Next, I wanna talk about where they're manufactured, and I'm gonna pull this straight from their websites. For, for the, the Glowforge, Glowforge when, when I search for that, that it, it says that every unit is manufactured by Flex, which, which is one of the best respected, respected manufacturers in the world. world. I personally don't know anything about Flex, so you'll have to take their word on that. And a facility used for producing Fortune 500 consumer electronic products. Now, they are designed in Seattle in the United States, and parts are sourced from around the world. So some of the units that they have seem to be assembled in Flex's U.S. facility, and then some are made in their Mexico facility. So what I gather from this is the components come from everywhere. It's not made necessarily in the USA. Um, so if that's important to you, just keep that in mind. So on the epilogue side, epilogue is designed and manufactured in the U.S. in Golden, Colorado. So their facility has all the engineering, all the design, all the assembly and manufacturing. Now keep in mind that they do source things like their chips from overseas in Asia, uh, just like pretty much every electronics company ever. So there is that part of it, but the machine is made in the U.S. Next up, let's talk about the tubes. So on the Glowforge, if I pull this out, the glass tube 
is connected to the actual gantry. So this is a CO2 glass tube. It is a 45 watt tube. You can see the water cooling loop going around here. So the water will go inside, go out the other side, and it will recirculate back through. There is a water cooling pump inside of the Glowforge built in that will help keep this cool. And it looks like it's just held on by two clamps. On the epilogue, you will have to take off this back panel, but once you do, you'll see this. So behind that panel is the metal ceramic tube. This one is a 30 watt tube in comparison to the 45 watt on the Glowforge. And up top, you'll see fans. These are the fans that keep the tube cool. There are heat sink fins on the top to help disperse the heat and keep the laser source cool. Now there's something to keep in mind with glass tubes versus metal tubes. So there's a lot of information online saying that the power on the glass tube could be inferior to the power on a metal ceramic tube. Um, I don't have any of my own knowledge to dispute any of that, but I have used both a 40 watt glass tube and a 40 watt metal tube. And I have noticed some differences that I want to point out. The first is the consistency. So on the metal tube, I've never had an issue with the job consistency. It always seems to get the proper airflow and cooling as long as you have that machine pulled enough away from the wall that air can circulate through those fans and keep the tube cold. On a glass tube, I've had the water cooling circuit where for some reason the water was not cooling it consistently and evenly and it would actually leave little spots in my jobs where it just wouldn't machine. Now I haven't had that issue with the Glowforge Pro, but I have had it with other glass tube lasers. The other thing I wanna point out is glass tubes are much cheaper to replace. That being said, they also don't last as long. So on a metal tube, I usually see anywhere from four to five years, depending on what you're doing with it. On the glass tube, it's typically about one to two years, again, depending on what you're doing with it. So you have to buy about two, two and a half glass tubes for every one metal tube. Now that's not the case for everybody, but that's been my experience and how often I've had to replace them. So at the end of the day, when it comes to tube costs and one being more expensive than the other, long-term, it's all about the same when you consider how many times you have to replace it and the stuff that's involved in replacing those tubes. One of the worst things I've ever seen happen to a glass tube is because it is glass and because there's water running through it, if you are in a cold environment and you are not temperature controlling where your machine is, the water can actually freeze inside of the tube and actually shatter the glass tube. I've seen this happen to a friend of mine's who did not keep it in the proper temperature range. The water froze, the tube actually bursts into a lot of pieces and you couldn't really do anything from there. Uh, it had to be sent in for refurbishment, but keep that in mind too, that you need to stick within the manual specification ranges for temperature conditions in order to make sure that not only it operates optimally, but if you're not using it, it doesn't freeze or do anything like that. Another thing I wanna point out about the Epilogue's metal tube is that it is excited by radio frequency meaning that you do have the ability to adjust the frequency of how often the laser pulses. Now, this gives it the ability to run at higher speeds and produce a really good result. On the glass tube, it does not have that radio frequency control, so you're not able to adjust the frequency or anything like that. Another thing to keep in mind is the metal tubes, like I said before, do seem to last quite a bit longer. Now, when it comes to replacing the tube or recharging the tube, if that has to be done, on the Glowforge, it has to be sent back to the factory as far as I can tell from everything I've read online, and they have to do that for you. With the Epilogue, you can send just your tube in and they will send you a replacement tube to put into place. So if you're trying to do things quickly and you need to get back up and running within a day because you're running a business, it's going to be much quicker to order a tube from Epilogue, get it sent to you, replace it yourself, and then send back the old one rather than go with a Glowforge where you're going to have to send the whole machine back, wait for them to do the work and send it back. Now I have been told that they do send a different refurbished machine back to you to help speed up that process, but I'll get into some of that later. As you heard me mention, the Glowforge is a 45 watt glass tube. 
The epilogue is a 30 watt metal tube. Now on paper, that shows that the Glowforge should have some kind of advantage just by the numbers. And with all the comments I've gotten lately about wattage and everything else, the more wattage, the better. And that's not always the case. So when we go to the real testing, we'll do a bunch of different tests. We'll try to cut through different thicknesses and materials and show the quality and the results. So just keep that in mind as we get to that section that yes, they are two different powers, but that doesn't necessarily mean that more power is better. The next thing I wanna to touch on is the speed of the machining. Now, when it comes to cutting, the metal tubes and the glass tubes are fairly comparable and wattage will come to play in that to some regard. When it comes to engraving, I'm actually going to show you what it says online about these machining speeds so that you see for yourself exactly what's on their websites. So on the Glowforge, which is over on the left for the Glowforge Pro, it says cut speed 120%. I'm going to assume that that means that the Glowforge Pro is 120% better than its basic model. It doesn't tell you much of anything of what that number means, and it doesn't equate it to any kind of inches per second or meters per second or anything like that. When it comes to the epilogue, which is on the right, the maximum engraving speed is 60 inches per second or 1.5 meters per second with a 3.5 G acceleration. So you can actually control this within 0.001 increments all the way up to 100%. So we'll see in the real life testing what this looks like. But another thing I wanna point out is while I've been using the Glowforge, if I tried to max out that speed and get it to be as high as possible, I often see that it takes my engravable area from maybe this wide and cuts it down to maybe this wide. And I assume that's to be able to build up the acceleration to get that speed, but that severely limits your machine bed size. And I haven't seen that need on the epilogue. As far as connecting to the machines and running them, the Glowforge is Wi-Fi only. The epilogue, you can connect through Wi-Fi, USB, or ethernet. So if the Wi-Fi were to go down, you can still run the epilogue. If the Wi-Fi were to go down on the Glowforge, you can't run the machine. The next thing I wanna to touch on are the laser classes. So the epilogue is a class two laser. The Glowforge is a class four. Let's go over to the computer and I'll show you a couple differences. So when it comes to laser classes, you'll see here on this chart that a class two has a low chance of injury or hazard, whereas a class four has a high chance of injury or hazard. I'll leave this site in the link below so that you can look at the laser class information for yourself. The epilogue has interlocks that as soon as you open the lid, it'll shut off and there's no visible stuff when that happens. The Glowforge is considered a class four, which means that the openings on it uh, can allow the beams to escape. Now the class four is supposed to have somebody designated as a laser safety officer in order to be able to run it and have it in your facility or your site. This is why a lot of schools don't have them necessarily because they need to appoint somebody to be that laser safety officer and sometimes don't have those resources. Uh, but keep that in mind when it comes to the safety and being around children and all of that stuff. Next is the pass-through. The Glowforge has a pass-through that you can slide materials up to a quarter of an inch thick through it. Uh, you do have to slide it through from the back of the machine and you have to take some metal parts off of it, which are part of why it's considered a class four laser. The epilogue doesn't have a pass through. You can take the front panel off and be able to slide some thicker things in through there, uh, but there is no opening in the back. So you can't pass through like a giant, like four foot long piece of material. This is probably one of the biggest differences that you'll see between these two machines is that the one has a pass-through and the other one does not. Another key thing to highlight on the pass-through is when the Glowforge is using the pass-through, it uses the camera to align your artwork in order to be able to do that pass-through. And if you're slightly off, it's not going to work properly. Now you do have to have room from behind the machine in order to do the pass-through option. So if you don't have room to pull it out, uh, that's not gonna be something that you'll be able to use. I've had machines with pass-throughs and I've had machines without pass-throughs. 
I haven't used them a ton. Uh, they can be handy at times, but depending on what I'm doing, I can always usually find a way around it. Uh, so I wouldn't say that it's a necessity, it's more of a nice to have. Now let's talk about the cameras. On the Glowforge, there's a camera on the lid that's used for positioning, and then there's another camera in the laser gantry area that is used for the autofocus. On the epilogue, there's a camera in the middle of the lid for positioning, and the focus is actually done either through a manual focus gauge like this, or there's a plunger system on the head that will actually touch your material, bring it back up, and that's how it will autofocus. So on the epilogue, there's just the one camera. The next difference is how you actually reference your material to the machine bed. On the Glowforge, there is a zero zero. It's kind of just built into this bed. If I slide it to the left, it catches. If I slide it forward to go to the back, you can see that it doesn't catch very well. Now you can definitely take the time and push it down in that one spot and make sure it catches, but it's not going to be a quick thing where you can just go because it's going to slide right through. Now, one of the reasons that it slides like that is so that you can use the pass through in the back. So if you want to have a repeatable zero zero, you're going to have to come up with a slightly better solution for that. On the epilogue, they have the rulers that stick up proud from the bed. And if I slide it to the left, it stops. And if I slide it up, it stops. So there's that nice corner point for reference. If you need to be able to have a repeatable positioning to use things like jigs or specific products, where you need that zero zero to always be the same. The next difference that I want to talk about is the motion control. So the motors, the belts, and those type of components. So on the glow parts, I'm going to zoom in over to this area. On here, there's a metal piece that goes from the front of the machine to the back of the machine that has a V-shape groove on it. This little plastic wheel sits on that groove to help move it forward and backward. There's also this thin belt here that's about a quarter of an inch wide that helps move that gantry back and forth. It's also the same thing on the left-hand side of the machine. There's the plastic wheel and this little belt here that helps drive it. And then on the actual gantry, there's this thin belt that matches the ones on the Y gantry that helps move the head back and forth. And on the gantry, when this is moving back and forth, all of this ribbon cable is exposed. The belt's exposed. So a lot of this over time will start getting dirty and you'll have to clean it. The other thing that I found interesting here is that this head just pops off. So that you can replace components if you need to. But I did find that when putting this back on, you do have to be more careful when positioning it to make sure that this ribbon cable doesn't bunch up on itself. On the epilogue, this is actually part of the safeguard. So there's no access to the belts on the left or right hand side. In order to get access to the belts, you'll have to take off the side panels and that's where you'll see the motor and everything else. This belt is about three eighths of an inch wide, and these are Kevlar belts. Also on this one, you do have the motor that goes straight up to the belt. There's no plastic wheels here. It's all stainless steel components. There's also stainless steel Teflon coated self lubricating bearings that are just more of an industrial level component. There's also these stainless rods. So overall, there are more industrial level components in the epilogue setup. And then on the gantry, you do have the laser head that moves back and forth. This is bolted onto the carriage. It does not come off unless you unbolt everything. And there is a Kevlar belt here that helps drive that left to right. And this belt is almost three quarters of an inch wide. One of the big things to keep in mind is on the Glowforge, you don't have access to a lot of the components, but those components do have access to a lot of the dust and debris that is caused during the machining process. There's no covers on the left and right hand side or really on the gantry of any kind to help keep it clean. So everything is going to be exposed and you're going to be able to have to clean that out. And with limited access, that's going to be a little difficult. On the epilogue, they do have the safeguard system. So you saw that the gantry was covered to help keep it clean of debris. The left and the right hand side have that accordion cover to help keep that clear as well. 
but you do have access to the other sides if you take off panels so that you can clean behind them if necessary. And I did touch on this a little bit, but the autofocus is the next difference. So on the Glowforge, it uses a camera to be able to do that autofocus. You'll have to punch in your material thickness into their software and it will autofocus for you. So you're gonna have to have a tool that measures pretty well, such as a dial caliper, to be able to measure to the maybe two or three decimal points in order to make sure that the focus is as accurate as possible. On the epilogue, you have a few options. You can either autofocus in the software, you can autofocus using the nozzle, which will depress and spring back, or you can manually focus for things like tumblers or if you have an odd shaped product where you can use the manual focus gauge and do it that way. The next difference I saw was with the DPI rating. So on the Glowforge, it says it can go up to 1,355 DPI. The Epilogue has a range of 75 to 1,200 DPI. Most often I use the 500 or 600 DPI option on the epilogue and it does pretty well. There haven't been a lot of times where I've needed to use anything higher on the epilogue, but keep in mind when you are working with DPI, the higher the DPI, the slower that the job is going to go. Now let's touch on how you control the actual machine. On the Glowforge, you have a single button. Once the job's sent over from the software, you'll hit that button once it's white and the job will go. On the epilogue, you have a seven inch touch screen that you can go, you can switch between jobs if you have multiple jobs here. You can save jobs directly to the machine. You can automatically focus. You can adjust your Z height. You can turn on your red dot pointer. You can jog your machine left to right with the joystick or up and down with the joystick. You can trace your jobs when they're sent over. And if you need to, you can also get into the machine settings do your alignment, your camera calibration, things like that, all within this LCD screen. So just to recap a little bit on the actual machine controls, the Glowforge just has the one button to stop or start jobs or pause them. The Epilogue has the seven inch touchscreen that gives you a lot more flexibility. So you can send multiple jobs over to the machine at once. You can save jobs directly to the machine because it has onboard memory. Uh, where you can save jobs, be able to turn your machine off, come back the next day, turn it on again, and run the same job that you saved yesterday, which I think is really nice if you're in a production setting. Both of them have autofocus, but only Epilogue has the ability to do more of a manual focus with the manual focus gauge. And another key thing to point out here is if you wanna rerun a job on a Glowforge, you have to send the job over to the machine run it and then resend it again from the software because it goes up to their cloud and then down to your machine. So you'll have to rerun that from the software every time you want to rerun the same job. On the epilogue, you just go over to the touch screen, hit go, and it reruns the same thing. So there's a ton of information about the tech specs and a lot of the differences. I know it was a lot. Thank you for sticking with me. Uh, but now we're going to go into some of the accessories that you can get for both machines. In this next section, I'm gonna to touch on some of the accessories, the support, and the warranty for both companies. On both machines, there are mandatory things that you have to have. They are the exhaust and the air assist. On the Glowforge, the air assist and the water cooling circuit that it requires are built into the machine, but you will need to have some type of exhaust system, whether it's a filter or an exhaust fan. On the epilogue, you're going to need an air compressor and an exhaust system. The epilogue comes plumbed with everything for the air assist in it, and there's a port on the back where you will plug the air compressor in, and then there's the exhaust, which can either be the exhaust fan or a filter system. That's gonna be what's required to run the machine. Now, as far as optional accessories on the Glowforge, the only real optional accessory I saw was the air filtration uh, system. So it's a filter system so you can run the machine indoors without exhausting outside. With the epilogue, there are a few more accessories that are optional. There's a stand that they offer that you can purchase to sit the machine on if you don't have something to sit it on already. There's a rim style rotary to be able to do tumblers and mugs and things like that. So you can do tumblers on the epilogue. You can't actually fit tumblers on the Glowforge. So if you want to use like a Yeti or something like that, you won't be able to do that on the Glowforge. They also offer a three jaw chuck rotary, which is more for uh, specific types of rotation. So you'll see some of these with like ring engraving, 
or things where you have to be much more precise. I've never actually used the three jaw chuck style. I've always just used the rim style. You can also get different lenses. So on the epilogue, you can get a 1.5 inch. It comes with a two inch or you can get a four inch. So 1.5 is for more detailed engraving. Four inch is better for things like cutting and engraving on curved surfaces. You can also get a filter control connection cable to be able to control your filter. So when you turn on the machine, it turns the filter on. And they also offer a pin table to elevate your items off of the bed. And Epilogue also offers a photo laser plus software to be able to engrave photos really well. So those are just some of the accessories that you can get. When it comes to support and I look online on the Glowforge website, there is an email listing and there's also a form that you can fill out to get support. It does have a phone number that you can call, but it doesn't tell me what hours that they're operational. On the Epilogue site, you can call them. It's 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, Mountain Time. They do have a chat support that if you chat with them, that usually actually goes pretty quick. But no matter which option you choose, you can also get help the same day. There's also an email you can contact if you prefer email instead of the chat or phone option. Next up is the warranty. From the factory, the Glowforge comes with a one year warranty. There are options to purchase extended warranties, but it looks like from the website that they're carried out through a third party company and not through Glowforge themselves. Having not purchased it or used it, I'm not sure what that's like. I have been told that there are parts that you can replace yourself, like the head and the lens and those type of items inside of there. But if it's something like a tube or a motherboard or a pump or things like that that are more hidden inside of the machine, you're going to have to send the machine back. And if you send the machine back, what they do is they fix the part. But what they'll typically do is they will send you a refurbished machine that they already have ready to go. So they'll send you that machine instead. So the machine you send out may not be the machine that you get back. So just food for thought. On the epilogue, you get a two year warranty. Pretty much if anything breaks, you can get the part sent to you and you can replace it yourself because you have access to pretty much every side of the machine. The only time you'd really have to send it back is if something really drastic happened, which is really rare. The other thing to keep in mind is if a part were to go out, like say a laser tube or a motor or whatever were to go out, once you replace that part, you get a brand new two year warranty on that part. So if you have a tube go out, you get a new tube. That tube now has a new two year warranty. So from a long term warranty perspective, I would say that this one is the better deal. That's going to cover the tech specs, the support and the warranty. Now, a lot of this was more of the like boring information that is necessary to know but isn't necessarily like the sexiest thing about this video. So what I'm gonna do now is actually tell you about my Discord community. I have a Discord community that is free. I'm going to link that in the description below. That community is all about helping other laser owners, whether you have a Chinese laser, an Epilogue, a Trotec, a Glowforge, whatever it may be. That community is encouraged to help each other with problems, troubleshoot problems, show off your projects and what you've made, and then just get to know each other so that you can meet other laser owners. So again, if you want to join that community, it's completely free. I'm going to put that in the links below. The next thing I'm going to do is walk through how you get a job from the computer over to the machines, show you what that process is like. And then once I've gone through that, we'll run some jobs that are real time. I'll show you the speeds. I'll show you the settings. I'll show you the results. So there's going to be quite a few different tests. I'm going to do a raster only test. I'm going to do a vector only test. I'm going to do a rotary test, a pass through test, a camera accuracy test, and then I'll cap it off with a full bed production test to see how many items I can make on one bed, how long it takes and how that equates to pricing. To compare the workflows, I'm going to send a photo engraving job over to the machine. This is going to be one of the first jobs that I'm going to actually machine on them and compare the speeds and powers and all of that. Now I'm going to start with a photo that I've already inverted the colors on in Adobe Illustrator. I'm going to show you how to take it from Illustrator and send it to each of the machines. 
So I'm gonna power up both machines. It's going to get a little bit noisy, so hopefully I can cut through some of that noise. But let's go ahead and we'll start off with the Glowforge. I do wanna point out that on the Glowforge, I have the subscription to get priority on job processing and all of the extra tools. So that is an extra monthly fee if you choose to pay for that. So just keep that in mind during the testing. In the Glowforge software, I have to upload an SVG, a DXF, or a PDF. So in Illustrator, I have my design. The one on the right is the photo that I'm trying to engrave. The one on the left is basically the colors inverted in order to engrave it. So what I'm going to do is delete this original one because this is the one I want to work with. In order to send it over to the Glowforge, I need to save it as a PDF. So I'm going to do save as PDF overwrite my existing file that I have. I'm going to go back to the Glowforge side, select upload, go down to my photo test two and say open. It will start uploading and processing that design. It does take a couple of minutes to get that into their software. So we just have to wait momentarily for that to happen. Now, one thing I want to point out with the Glowforge is they do have a catalog of designs that you can choose from and purchase. Uh, that is one thing that they offer. They also have the pro membership to the actual software to get extra tools and processing speeds and things like that. So just keep all of that in mind. So now that the photo is here, I'm going to drag it over top of my item. I did make it slightly larger than the item just to make sure that I cover the whole thing. Now I've gone through about six hours of testing different settings, different options, and consulting with Glowforge owners to come up with a setting that looks good enough for the test. Now you may need to dial this in even more if you want it to look better, but I did spend a lot of time trying to get this to work. So I'm going to show you the settings that I use for that. So over here, it is an unknown material because they don't have anodized aluminum in here. It is 0.024 thick. Then under the settings, I'm actually going to choose this alder photo that I have started. I am going to run this at 750 speed. I'm going to do full power converted to dots with maximum quality. And I'm going to change the lines per inch to 450 and it's going to be an auto height based on the material thickness that I just put in. So this is the settings that I found that give a good enough result for what I'm trying to do in this test. Again, you may need to tweak them, but I'm gonna go ahead and send these over to the machine. So I'm gonna hit ready. It's going to start uploading. Now the thing to keep in mind with the Glowforge is when you want to print a job, it sends it to the servers on the Glowforge side, and then it has to come back from the server down to your machine. You will see here that I am in the lightning or fast lane because I pay for that service every month. This job is going to take 21 minutes and 17 seconds, according to the estimation. But do keep in mind that if I want to rerun this job, I'm going to have to keep sending this over one at a time I can't just go to the machine and keep hitting the button to rerun it. Let's go ahead and machine that job. I am going to show you the real time speed for the first maybe 20 seconds or so. And then I'm gonna time lapse it just so you don't have to make this even even longer video to wait 20 minutes. But I will show you what it looks like at the end. Here's the result on the Glowforge engraving. 
The total time was 21 minutes and 17 seconds. Now let's go through the epilogue workflow. Since Epilogue uses more of a print driver style software, I can print directly from Adobe Illustrator. So if I hit print, I select my printer, make sure that it's the size of my bed or my artwork, and I select print. Once I do that, it opens up the Epilogue software. I can zoom in and place my photo with the camera. You can see my tags tilted a little bit. So for this photo, I'm actually going to import a setting to start with. I'm gonna import the photo aluminum 400 DPI. I'm going to change this to 300 DPI, 60% speed, and 25% power. I'm also going to change the dithering to Stucky because this works really well with photos, and I'm going to engrave it from the bottom up. So on this one, the prediction is that it's going to take two minutes and 23 seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and hit print and it will send over to the laser. All right, over at the machine, it did bring the job over. So I just make sure that it's selected and then I just hit the play button. So a cool thing about this is it will show you on the epilogue how long it actually took, not just what was predicted. So this job took two minutes and 10 seconds. And this is the result of the machining on the epilogue. So let me do a side by side. Okay, here's a comparison of the difference. The Glowforge is on the left, the epilogue is on the right. You can see that there's a lot more detail on the epilogue one. The Glowforge has some good coloring in areas, but it's missing a lot of that detail. Again, you might be able to get better results on the Glowforge, but I spent at least six hours trying to dial in a setting that would work. The epilogue I spent maybe 30 minutes. The Glowforge took 21 minutes and 17 seconds. The epilogue took two minutes and 10 seconds for a difference of 19 minutes and seven seconds. Just out of curiosity, I wanted to make it a much larger picture, one that people would probably want as an actual size. So I changed it to be 10 inches wide, which has a height of about 5.7, so it's a 10 by 7 photo. It isn't really a standard size, but it is much closer to a size that people would actually want, you know, like the 4x6, 5x7, 8x10 type style. Uh, so that's what we're shooting for. All I'm going to do is do a time prediction to see how long it would take to do a photo of that size. So first on the Glowforge, I have the width as 10 inches, the height as 5.714. I'm keeping the same exact settings that I just used. I'm going to hit ready to print and we'll see how long it says. So on the Glowforge, it would take two hours and four minutes for that 10 inch wide by about 5.7 inch tall photo. Two hours and four minutes. Now let's check out what it would be on the epilogue. So on the epilogue, I went ahead and stretched it as well. It says 10 inches wide by 5.717 inches tall. So it's 0 0.003 taller than the Glowforge one. If I use the same exact settings that I just used, my runtime is 11 minutes and 13 seconds. So in order to do the same size photo in a slightly larger size, it's going to take one hour, 52 minutes and 47 seconds longer on the Glowforge. This is with the settings that I've been able to get to work. There might be a more optimal setting, but that gives you a sense of the time difference you're going to encounter in a raster job when you start taking up more of the bed. All right, that was the raster only test. So let's get into the vector only test. I'm going to be using a mandala design that I have from past jobs. It's going to be about 4.5 inches tall by 4.5 inches wide. Same size on both machines. I'm going to be using this piece of alder wood. It's listed at an eighth of an inch. 
Uh, I'll actually tell you the correct thickness when I put it into the software. I'm not going to put any kind of masking on it. I wanna see what it would do if I just machine the bare wood. So first up, I'm going to do the Glowforge. So let me show you what the settings are gonna be. So for this test, I am using the piece of alder wood. The actual thickness is 0 0.104 inches. Under my settings, I'm going to be using 200 speed and full power. That's what I've noticed actually works and cuts through this material. If I click on this, the size is 4.5 by 4.5. Because it's close to the top and bottom of the material, I'm going to actually rotate it a little bit just to make sure it lands on the material. And then I'm going to hit ready to print. So when it comes to the times for cutting, I would expect them to be pretty close to the same amount of time because the speeds and the different motors really come into play with engraving, not as much with cutting. So the cutting is more going to be about the quality of the cut, how detailed the cut is. Those are the things that we're going to be looking for. So on the Glowforge, it's going to take nine minutes and 24 seconds. So let's go over to the machine and cut it out. All right, so the job is finished on the Glowforge. I can't pick it straight off. It's like it glued itself to the base. So I'm trying to lift it delicately so as to not break it. Okay, well, I broke it. This is the kind of stuff that happens sometimes if you use uncoated woods in certain machines. So I'm going to have to probably rerun it. Okay, I did rerun the job on the Glowforge. This time I put a piece of masking tape on the back to help loosen it up. So that seems to have solved the problem. Now, getting these parts out is gonna be difficult. So here you can see what it looks like. It does have uh, what looks like thicker cuts in a lot of spaces. I'm trying to get all this off. So I'm gonna fast forward real quick to when I have all this off. So there is a bit more charring on this one where the lines seem to be thicker. And I did have to mask it in order to get it off the table in one piece. Peeling this off of the back would be pretty difficult to be honest. So to be fair in the testing, I'm going to do the exact same thing on the epilogue. I'm not gonna code it. If it falls apart, it falls apart. We redo the whole test. It's in the software, so let me show you what I'm gonna do. So again, it is 4.5 by 4.5. I'm going to zoom in here. It's going to have the same trouble of hitting the material, so I'm going to rotate it until it's a little bit better. There we go. So that should work. This is the exact same piece of material. I'm going to cut it right next to the one I just cut. This way, it's the most fair that it can be. So on the settings, I'm going to import some vector settings for eighth inch wood. It's going to be a speed of 15%, a power of 100. And because it is an RF tube laser, I can adjust the frequency. I'm gonna make that 20. Another thing I have here on the epilogue is I can vector sort it, meaning I can do the inside first and then the outside or you can optimize it for time, which wouldn't care about inside or outside. So I'm gonna leave it inside out. Time is supposed to be nine minutes and 21 seconds. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit print and we're gonna see what happens. All right, so this one is on the epilogue. If I go over here, you can see that the time is nine minutes and 21 seconds. So we'll see if this one sticks to the table like the Glowforge did. So we're just gonna take this off. I'm 
so. It does stick a little bit, but not nearly as much. So let me try to get it all the way off. All right. So it did come off. Now, this is a pretty intricate design for this size. I probably wouldn't typically do this, but I thought it would be a good test to show what happens. All right, so it looks like all the pieces are out of it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put a piece of plastic in here so you can see it a little bit better. So this is the one from the epilogue. Now I'm not gonna rerun this. This one looks just fine. If I hold it up a little bit better. So you can see all the little details in it. This one didn't break at all when I tried to take it off the table. Again, I did not mask this piece of material. Here they are side by side. This one over here is the Glowforge. This one here is the Epilogue. So this is what I mean when I say that speed isn't necessarily different on cutting because they were pretty comparable. The Glowforge took nine minutes and 24 seconds. The Epilogue took nine minutes and 21 seconds. So about the same amount of time. Now the difference is the cut quality. So you can see that on the Glowforge one, there's a lot more charring on the material. It looks like it cuts wider paths in a few spots. So that's what you get with that one. And then on the epilogue, it's a lot cleaner. You still see the wood color. The cut quality seems to be quite a bit better. The beam doesn't seem to be as wide. So those are really the two differences side by side, and you can see them for yourself. Now that we've cut through some eighth inch material, I'm going to test the limits of the epilogue because it's a 30 watt machine and try to cut a quarter inch of MDF. Now, everything tells me that it shouldn't do that online, meaning that you need at least 40 watts to do that. 30 watts won't cut it. So we're gonna test that out. I'm also going to cut quarter inch MDF on the Glowforge. So first up, let's test the Glowforge and then we'll do the epilogue. For the Glowforge, I'm actually using the thick draft board setting, which is 132 speed, full power. I'm going to try to do this in one pass. That's the goal, is one single pass. So I'm gonna go ahead and send this over to the machine. Keep in mind that this is six inches wide and 3.274 inches tall. All right, so it's gonna take five minutes and 15 seconds. So we'll go ahead over to the machine and try to cut it out. All right, so here's the Glowforge. It does look like it cut all the way through, which is good. Now, all the pieces are coming out. If I look at the backside, it looks like it's all just fine. There you go. So it did cut it out. And here is what it ended up looking like. So next up is the epilogue. Keep in mind, the Glowforge is a 45 watt tube. The epilogue is a 30 watt tube. A lot of people say on a 30 watt, you can't cut quarter inch material period. So we're gonna put that to the test. Now I'm gonna try to cut it at a similar time to the Glowforge and see what happens. So on the epilogue software, I do have the same design, same material, same size. If I go over to my settings, I'm going to run this at 5% speed, 100 power with 20% frequency. It says it's going to take 5 minutes and 47 seconds, which isn't too far off of what the Glowforge did. If this works, that means that the Epilogue 30 watt can indeed cut quarter inch material, which would be pretty impressive, honestly. So let's send it over to the machine and we'll try to cut it out.
All right, so here's the epilogue. It took five minutes and 41 seconds. That's a good sign. That's an even better sign. So let's try to get all these pieces out. And there we have it. So the 30 watt did cut through quarter inch MDF in about the same time as the Glowforge. A little bit slower, but not by much. All right, so here are both of them. This one is the Glowforge. This one is the Epilogue. What I can tell is that there's a lot more residue on the top of this, on the Glowforge one, than there is on the Epilogue one. So the Epilogue did cut cleaner. I also see that the Epilogue has thicker areas than the Glowforge one. If I flip them over, they look about the same on the back. So not much of a difference there. One thing I want to mention about the spot size between a glass tube and a metal tube, which you can see in the examples that I machined, is that the glass tube has a larger dot size or spot size than the RF metal tube. Sometimes as much as three times bigger than the RF one. That's why some of that detail work you saw on the intricate design actually turned out a little bit better, in my opinion, on the epilogue than it did on the Glowforge. So keep in mind that that spot size will affect some of your machining processes. So now that we've done a quarter inch test, I'm going to do a pass through test. So this one is going to be run only on the Glowforge. The epilogue, although you can take the front panel off and put stuff into it, you can't actually pass through a really long piece of material. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a job on the Glowforge, use the pass through and show you what that looks like. Um, that way you can see what that feature does. In order to use the pass through, I have to take off this metal part on the front of the machine. This is part of why this one is considered a class four laser. And then there's also one at the back of the machine that we have to take off as well. Once those are off, I can slide the material through and we can start the process. In, In the Glowforge software, software, to, to get, get to the pass-through, you have to click on more and select Pro Pass-through. This, this does mean that this is only an option on the Glowforge Pro. Pro. This design I could technically make on the epilogue just fine, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to shrink it down just to make sure it doesn't take forever to do this. So I'm purposely putting it over the pass-through line. I'm going to cut it through the middle of an engraving and a cut to see how well they line up. For the engraving, I'm just going to use 535 speed with 70% power and 270 lines per inch. For the cut, I'm going to use a speed of 183 with full power. This is the medium draft board setting. So I'm going to go ahead and click ready to print. When, when I do, do that, that, you will see that it cuts the design in half at that, that dashed line where it does the pass-through. The pass-through pass is, through is all driven through the camera system. system. So, so now, now that, that it's lined up, up I'm going to go ahead, ahead and, and hit print. print. Okay, now that the first part has machined, it's taking pictures of the bed. It says don't move your material or anything to help align it. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to wait for that to finish. Again, this is using the camera to align everything. Uh, that's really the only way that this works. Okay, so now it's telling me to pull the material eight inches forward. So I'm going to go ahead and slide that through. So now that I've slid it through, I'm going to hit continue. So here's the job. You can see that it did shift forward. All right, so it did try to align it by itself. You can see that it's pretty misaligned. Uh, this isn't gonna work. So I'm gonna try to align this manually. All right, so now that it lets me, I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to try to align this to the best of my ability. The height looks about right. So I think that might do it. But again, you are having to use cameras in your eye to try to line this up if it does mess up the automatic alignment. 
but we're, we're going to go ahead and hit print, print and, and we'll, we'll finish, finish cutting, cutting this out. out. So this is the pass through test results. Let me open the lid. So this is a problem. Um, I didn't move anything and the software and the camera side of it, it all lined up. If I had left it where it did it automatically, maybe this would have worked, but you can see that there's a little bit of a difference left to right because that doesn't line up. The forward and backward obviously didn't line up at all so in the software it was on top of each other and it looked correct but once i went to machine it uh it didn't line up so i don't know if you trust the automatic or if you trust the camera and what you position it at but they make this look really easy in the videos that they do but every time i've used the pass through i've had a similar problem like this so I'm not sure what it is, and maybe it just takes a bunch of practice to get used to it, but it's not quite as intuitive and accurate as the videos make you believe. Now that we've done something that the Glowforge was designed to do that the epilogue was not, it's time to do something that the epilogue was designed to do that the Glowforge was not. This will not fit in a Glowforge. Let me show you. All right, so here's the Glowforge bed with the vector table taken out. Here's the mug. It will not go underneath of the head. There's also no rotary attachment for this machine. So doing actual cylindrical items is not possible on the Glowforge unless you do them flat. And even if you do them flat, they have to be shorter than that distance. So tumblers, if that's your business, I wouldn't use a Glowforge. Okay, I've already got the job set up to be in rotary. It's got center center engraving with a rotary attachment. So I'm actually going to engrave this at 60 speed and I'm going to do 100 power. I'm going to use the Stucky dithering and I'm going to do it from the bottom up so I can watch it engrave. The runtime says it's going to take 3 minutes and 21 seconds. So I'm going to send this over to the machine and we'll try it out. Here's the finished tumbler. With tumblers, depending on the kind of coating it has, whether it's powder coating or a thinner coating like this one, uh, your settings may be different than what I used. But for this mug that I got from JP Plus, uh, the settings worked really well. So you can see all the detail in it. But if you're going to be doing tumblers as part of your business, the epilogue may be the way to go. I wanted to highlight a test for each machine that the other one can't do. So the Glowforge has the pass through, the epilogue has the rotary. The epilogue, you can get around some of the pass-through things, not all of them. Uh, the Glowforge, there is no solution to the rotary option. Uh, you won't be able to do tumblers and yetis and things like that. The Glowforge does have its trace feature where you can draw on a piece of material, put it underneath the camera, it will trace it and then engrave it. The epilogue does not have that built into its functionality, but you can use the camera on the epilogue to take a snapshot of the bed, go into design software, capture the design, and then send it back over to the engraver as a workaround. So that's not something that the epilogue can't do. It's just not built into its software. The next test that I'm going to do deals with the camera accuracy. What I'm going to do is take a design just overlay it on the wood. I'm going to engrave it, and then I'm going to look at the camera in the software compared to where it landed, and then just look at the two as a general rule. Now, there are other ways you can do testing of the camera accuracy. I'd probably run like five more, but I've already spent a lot of time the testing different things on this video. So this is the way I'm gonna do this one. I'm gonna test it on both, same exact design, I'll use the same material, even I'll engrave one pretty close by. We'll check that one out, engrave the other, check that one out. This isn't really like a super scientific test. It's more just like a visual test 
like, hey, did it land where the camera said it would, or is it slightly off or not? Let's kick it off with the Glowforge. To do this test, I put the material right underneath of the camera in the center of the bed. So for the camera, the best place to use it is right beneath the camera. The corners of the bed aren't a great place to do it. So that's where you need to check. And that's where you need to basically do all your jobs if you're using the camera is definitely try to use right below the lens. It's gonna be your most accurate spot. So what I've done is put the material straight under the camera. On the software side, I can see it lined up. For the settings, they don't really matter, but I'm going to do 940 speed, 50% power, and 340 dots per inch or LPI. I'm going to try to do similar settings on the Glowforge just to be uh, as fair as possible. But I'm going to go ahead and print this. We're going to let it run, and then I'm gonna come back in the software, zoom in without touching anything, and we'll see where the engraving landed versus where the camera set up. All right, so the engraving finished. It is right beneath the camera. So I'm gonna zoom in to the graphic and you can see that the graphic is fairly aligned in some places. It looks like some of it creeps out. Whether that's from alignment or whether that's from the beam size just being bigger. If it was the beam size being bigger, I'd expect that around the whole thing. Uh, it actually looks like it engraved a little bit to the right of where the graphic said it would based on the shading that's in there. So it's not terrible it would be passable in most cases so it's not too bad i'm going to do the same thing on the epilogue so it's going to be 350 dpi speed of 70 percent power of 50 percent no dithering or anything like that uh, same exact graphic same piece of material i'm going to engrave it right next to it basically so i'm going to send this over and then we'll compare that one All right, the epilogue just finished, so let's compare that one. I'm gonna zoom in, and it looks really close to what it should have been. You will see just a little bit of it uh, on the sides of it, but it's honestly really hard to tell. So this one would be good. I think it's passed. Honestly, both of them are pretty similar. That one's more of just to show, like if you're using the camera, does it kind of land where it's supposed to? especially if you're trying to place things onto like cutting boards or other things where you want it in a pretty specific spot. But I think both of these could do that just fine. The last test for this video is going to be a full bed production test where I'm going to be engraving these cork coasters. I am going to make a jig for each machine. I'm not going to video the actual jig part of it because I'm just going to use the same a eighth inch MDF that I use in the intricate vector cut design uh, in that test. So same material. Uh, the only difference is I'm going to make it the full bed size, as many coasters as I can fit. I think the Glowforge fits about 15. The Epilogue fits about 18. I'm going to go ahead and cut the jigs and then I will show you what those look like. And then we will put coasters in them and do the actual production level engraving test. All right, well, I hit a snag in making the jigs. So let me show you what happened. Okay, so here's what happened. I cut the jig and it worked originally on these five spots. And for some reason it didn't work on the rest. I then recut another pass and it worked on these four spots, but then it still doesn't work on these six. So if I try to lift this up and punch these out, they're not coming out which makes me believe that the machining is not consistent on the vector side from the left hand to the right hand and from the top to the bottom. So this may end up causing some kind of engraving issue with the full bed test, uh, but I'm going to keep trying to cut these out. We'll get them cut out and then however many times that takes, and then we'll put the coasters in. 
but I'll show you the epilogue one real quick. On the epilogue, the jig cut first time around. I've actually already stuck the coasters in, so they're ready to go whenever this test is ready to run. But you can see that they, they do fit nice and neat. The holes in the jig are about 0.01 larger in diameter, or 0.02, than the coasters are. The coasters are 3.5 inch in diameter. All right, I tried to recut the jig uh, twice now. So here's the front on the Glowforge. Here's the back. So you can see that on the right hand side of the machine, it is not cutting through and it actually gets worse as you get further away. Now, I'm going to keep messing with this until I get it to cut through so I can do this test. But if you're buying a machine and you're expecting it to work out of the box, which is what I've done here, I haven't adjusted anything on either machine and I just want it to run straight out of the box, this may not be something that's easy to deal with. It's going to require more know-how of how to adjust things and mess with it, and it could take a while to figure out. Um, so I'm going to try to uh, just get this to cut out, and I'll keep it as much the same as possible so I can just run the engraving test and see how that goes. Uh, but I wanted to show you guys the truth of what I encountered and what happens, and that's just where we are. So I'm going to keep messing with this. I'm going to probably actually flip the jig around uh, and put this side on the left side of the machine where I know it cut through and just try to line it up as best as possible. That way I can get the jig made and then we'll go into the engraving part. Before I went production mode, I tested a coaster on each machine just to make sure that the graphic would work right and that the machine would work right. Uh, in one of the spots. So on the epilogue, it did engrave the graphic I had right away, no issues. On the Glowforge, I used the same exact file, just saved it as a PDF. Uh, and it did have like layering with different colors, like white over black, which didn't have any issue on the epilogue. And this was interesting because I didn't realize this would happen. So on the Glowforge, you can see right here that it didn't do the white, meaning like it engraved something that it shouldn't have engraved. Because remember, this is the epilogue. It has that border cut through and it has it subtracted out. Same exact graphic and I get this. And I, I stopped the job because I had to redo the whole graphic. So I had to redo the entire file. And then once I did that, I got this result on the Glowforge. So it did work finally, but I had to redo the whole graphic for that to happen. Now that I know it'll work on both machines, I'm going to set up the full bed on both machines, let them run, see how long it takes, and then I'll break that down into like a, you know, coaster per minute type deal. And we'll see what the throughput is. I'm going to go ahead and start off with the Glowforge. So let's hop in the software and see what we can do. So in the Glowforge, this is my engraving area. I can fit 15 coasters total. The interesting thing here is I wanted to run it at 1000 speed because that is a setting I got from a Glowforge owner that said it works great. When I put in 1000 and I go back to my graphic, it cuts off part of my graphic and tells me I cannot machine it like that, which I think is interesting. So if I go to say 950, it's still like that. If I go to 925, it finally works. So we're gonna have to use 925 for this test. I'm not sure why that happens. That's something you're gonna have to deal with is where it cuts off part of the bed. Another thing I noticed was because it's limited to, I think it was 11.5 in the height direction, my jig started getting really close to the edge and I had to move up the jig and move it around to get it to work properly and actually machine everything. The repeatability, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult on this to get a registration point without building some kind of reference point that you know is gonna work but I'm going to be using 925 speed 
20% power with 340 lines per inch. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and hit ready. And then we'll see what the estimated time is. The other thing I'm interested to see is because I had trouble getting the jig to cut all the way across the bed, I'm interested to see what happens with the coasters engraving all the way across the bed. I'm interested to see if there's going to be fading as it goes more toward the right hand side uh, or if it's going to be consistent the whole way. So those are the things I'm going to be looking for as I'm watching this job and comparing the results. All right, so it looks like this job is going to take two hours and 48 minutes. Grab a coffee. It's going to be a long one. Uh, in fact, I'm not sure my camera will last two hours and 48 minutes. So what I'm going to do is start filming it. And if it cuts off, I'll try to restart it, but we'll see what happens. I'm going to pull one from the top left and one from the bottom right and show them together to see if there's any degradation. I can tell that some of them were slightly off center. And this is where having a repeatable zero zero to be able to lock everything in place would be handy. But here's the top left one. So it's pretty black in color. And then here's the bottom right one. It's also pretty black. If I put them side by side, I can tell that this one is deeper. This one's a little bit shallower. Like this one, I can catch my fingernail. This one, I can't. It's a lot smoother. I don't know if this is going to even show up. Yeah, I don't think it's going to show up. But you can kind of see how the one on the right is a little bit lighter. So this indicates to me that the distance from the item to the head is not the same from left to right, or mirrors are misaligned, or something is wrong. Uh, now, you would have to go through troubleshooting steps to correct this. I'm not doing that in this video. I'm just trying to run this straight out of the box to see what happens. But you may have to fiddle with that and call technical support. I'm not sure how you adjust a lot of that on this machine. Um, so keep that in mind as you go through this. It did take two hours and 48 minutes, which equates to about 11.2 minutes per coaster. Now we're going to make them on the epilogue. So I am going to start with the recommended settings and I'm just going to tweak the DPI to make it as fair as possible. So the DPI is 340, just like the Glowforge was. The speed is 100%. The power is 45%. I'm not doing any kind of dithering pattern on these. If you were to actually make these, the recommended DPI is 300. I am going to run them at 340 to match the Glowforge so that it's as even as possible. I'm not going to tell you how long it's going to take until they're done. So I'm going to go ahead and send this over to the machine and we'll start the engraving. All right, the epilogue is done. So I'm going to do the same thing. I'm gonna take one from the top left and one from the bottom right. Okay, so here's the top left. Here is the bottom right. Visually, they look about the same. Depth wise, they're about the same depth. I can catch my fingernail in both. It's hard to tell if there's any kind of difference, to be honest. Um, you'd have to try it out for yourself in person and see if there is a difference to you. I don't see one personally. This job made 18 coasters. So this extra column here, 
I could not fit on the Glowforge. So the Glowforge made 15, the epilogue made 18. The epilogue took, let me move this over here, 20 minutes and 43 seconds. That is the production test. I think it was pretty eye-opening what the difference is in these machines. So just to give you a recap, the Glowforge took 11.2 minutes per coaster. These coasters are 3.5 inches in diameter. So to engrave one of these took 11.2 minutes. If you're trying to sell a set of four of these, it's going to take you over 44 minutes to engrave one set of four coasters. The epilogue took 1.15 minutes per coaster. To make a set of four would take you maybe five minutes. So when it comes to being able to sell these and do a production level run and be able to make money based on your time, uh, the epilogue can make a lot more. The math behind that is for every single job of 15 on a Glowforge, so if I make one job of 15 on the Glowforge, I can make 146 on the epilogue. For every single coaster on the Glowforge, I can make 9.7 coasters on the epilogue. It's a giant difference, especially if you're running a business, throughput is everything, speed is everything. And this to me, is the main reason why I would get by the epilogue over the Glowforge. That's going to do it for all of the actual machine testing. Now I'm gonna to touch on one of the most important parts of this video, the cost. So to make everything the same, I already looked up machine prices for my location and because I don't get charged tax for epilogue machinery, but I would for Glowforge, it's not really an accurate representation. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to use a New York zip code. Uh, it's going to be 10036. It's a zip code that's really far away from uh, Epilogue. It's really far away from Glowforge. So the distance and shipping and all that should be about the same. It should collect taxes on both. So what I'm going to do is actually go to the computer, both websites. I will type in some information to get the cost and calculations, and we'll break that down for you. I just use a random test address. Uh, the New York, New York is real, and the 10036 is real. So for the Glowforge side of this, you would get the Glowforge Pro. It costs $6,995. You would get proof grade materials. It says $150 worth. Proof grade materials are basically their materials that they've tested and they put a barcode on. Uh, you get the Glowforge accessory kit, which is basically the vector table and the stuff that you need to run the machine. Uh, so there's nothing really exciting there. Uh, you would still need to buy an exhaust fan, but I'm not going to include that cost in here. So the subtotal would be $6,995. That's without any kind of coupons or deals or promo codes or anything else. The shipping is $350. The taxes are $651.87 for a total of $7,996.87. Now that we've done the calculation on the Glowforge side, let's go over to the Epilogue side and get that cost. So this is the first time that Epilogue has allowed you to actually buy them online, which is pretty cool. All right, so for the epilogue, the Fusion Maker 30 watt is $9,995. The shipping is $375. That does come with liftgate service. The taxes on this one are $920.35 for a total of $11,290.35. You would still have to buy the compressor and the exhaust fan as well. The Glowforge was $7,996.87. So if I take the 11 to 90.35 minus the 7996.87, the cost difference is $3,293.48. Depending on the state you live in, so for me in Nevada, when I type it in, I don't actually get charged the taxes on the website. I would have to pay taxes in Nevada when I actually get it. As far as the cost go with a difference of $3,298, uh, 
uh, it just depends on what you want to do. So if you're going to be doing this as a hobby, you don't intend to sell things you make you, or you don't have a need for it to be quick. You can waste a bunch of time waiting for things to get made and charge probably not what you're worth when it comes to production. Uh, the Glowforge would be fine. So back when Glowforge launched and it was like two or three thousand dollars for a machine back in the Kickstarter days, that probably was a good deal. Now with the price going up on the Glowforge and other machines being released like the Maker that are more meant for production, I feel like Glowforge put a lot of time and money into marketing lasers to households and help bringing them into households which is a really cool thing. I don't feel that they've done the same on the hardware side that they did on the marketing side. I feel like they put a lot of money into marketing and to get the name out there, they gave it to influencers. The influencers had affiliate links. Their whole affiliate program gave people a bunch of money off the machine every time they bought one. And it got a lot of people into it, which is great. But... At the same time, if you're able to give $500 of your machine to a customer and you're able to give $500 to the affiliate person who referred them, I feel like you're artificially inflating your price in order to do that. And you could have just dropped the price to do that in the first place. Um, so it just depends on how you look at it. Now, as far as the Glowforge goes, if you're doing it as a hobby, and you're not really trying to run a business with it. I'm not saying you can't run a business with it. I'm saying if you want to get as much throughput as possible, you want to be able to work through things very quickly. The Glowforge is going to be hard to keep up with orders and hard to keep up with the production level. Because remember in my production test example, it took 11.2 minutes to make one coaster in and it took 1.15 minutes per coaster on the epilogue, which is quite a bit different. So when people say, well, you know, the machine costs more and I don't know that that's worth it, it depends on what you're doing. So if you're running a business, throughput is everything and you want it to be reliable, you want it to be quick and you want to be able to fix things yourself if you have to, I would lean towards the epilogue. If you're going to go Glowforge, I would probably suggest going with the Plus model, probably not the Pro model, because I don't feel like the Pro is worth the money for what you get in comparison to the Maker. The engraving speeds were slower, the cutting was about the same, but the cut quality wasn't the same. So you just have to keep those factors in mind. At the end of the day, all that matters is if you're buying a laser that you get the one that you feel is right for you, your budget, your needs, and what you want to do. If you were to ask me which machine I'd recommend, if you're going to be doing it as a hobby and you're not going to really want to sell anything from it, you just want a laser to mess around with or to do cool projects or do YouTube videos or whatever, and you have a limited amount of money, say your budget's like five grand, six grand, I would probably go with the Glowforge Plus. I wouldn't go with the Pro, um, and that would be a bigger savings than going with the Pro. The only big difference I see is the pass-through. The speeds really don't seem to be a whole lot different from the specs online, and I don't really use a pass-through all that often anyway. So I don't see that as a feature that would require me paying that much more. And if I ever wanted to make bigger items, Honestly, I'd probably buy a cheaper CNC machine like a Shapeoko or Onefinity or something like that where you can do some bigger items and then combine the two technologies together and be able to make even more things. And it probably wouldn't cost you a whole lot more than if you went with just a Glowforge Pro. So just something to keep in mind. If you have the money to go with Epilogue or you're leaning towards the Pro and you want to be able to start a business or hopefully run a business one day with it, the epilogue you're going to be able to grow with, I don't feel like you're gonna be able to grow the business with the Glowforge as easily or as quickly as you could with the epilogue. 
So I'd probably suggest saving up the extra money and putting it into something like the Maker or a machine that has the same kind of speeds and capabilities. I know there's been a lot of information in this video. The video is super long, I get it. If you're still with me, thank you for watching the whole thing. I know it couldn't have been easy. Uh, if you liked the video and it was helpful, please consider subscribing to the channel, giving the video a thumbs up, and turning on notifications to know when I come out with new videos. Be sure to check out my Instagram, at Maker Experiment, where I share things like this while I'm testing them and while I'm doing things along the way. Um, again, if you have any questions about either machine, put them in the comments below. I'll do my best to answer those. But I want to thank you for taking your time to watch this video, and I'll see you in the next one.